You're listening to another episode of the Young Investors Podcast, so sit back and relax as myself, Brandon, and my buddy Hamish discuss the latest in the world of finance and stock market investing. Now, a quick reminder before we get into the podcast is that nothing in this podcast should be taken on as personal financial advice. If you're ever unsure about your finances or investing and you need some help, make sure you reach out to a qualified financial advisor. But with all that said, let's get into another episode of the Young Investors Podcast. Welcome back, everybody. Welcome back. Good friend, Hamish Hodder, what's going on? I got my uh, Berkshire Hathaway share during oh, the week. Have you got yours? Good. I do. I've got mine as well. Yep. All hey. the way through. It's a little bit more difficult to buy shares uh, in the US when you're Australian because you have to, you can't just kind of stick it in during the day, like while the markets are open, you kind of have yeah. to make a little bit of a prediction and then <laughs> see what happens when you wake up. Yeah. Put in your limit order and cross your fingers and... Although even if you put in a like a limit order and you overshoot the price, you yeah. still get the best available price, right? I think so. Yeah. That's the, what is it called? The national best bid and offer regulation or whatever it's called. Oh. Um, but yeah, we have, uh, we've got our, our Berkshire Hathaway share and uh, next step is to get a pass. <laughs> <laughs> so, we've got step one done. Now, we've got to get a pass to the Berkshire um, shareholder meeting, which is- in a couple of months time. So, we're working through that. And then after that, it's mm. uh, it's booking flights, it's booking accommodation and uh, and over we go. How, how long would you want to go over there for? Uh, I don't know. I'd be, I'd be down to stay for a little while and, and go see a couple of places, maybe move around a little bit. I don't know. What are you thinking? A couple of weeks? Yeah, I was definitely thinking like a couple of weeks because where is... Where is Omaha? It's in Nebraska. So, it's right It's right in the guts, isn't it? It's, mm. it's literally right in the dead center. Well, I suppose Kansas looks more like in the dead center. But I reckon we should go Nebraska, down, Kansas, Oklahoma. I want to go to Texas. There's so much cool stuff I reckon we could do in Texas. Namely, uh, go look at the Giga Factory <laughs> and also go to Boca Chica and look at the SpaceX uh, launch site. That would be pretty sweet. Yeah, that would be cool. Yeah, I, I haven't been to well, I haven't been to the US in a very long time anyway. Um, but uh, I, I haven't been to Central America at all. So you said you did the coasts, didn't you? Yeah. So I've been I've been twice, and this is like a long time ago. These are like family trips. So yeah. you know, my memory of them is is faded anyway. But um, yeah, I've done a little bit of 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 both coasts. Um, right. So okay. yeah, I'm excited to to see see some more of the US. It's a big country. There's a lot of different a uh, lot of different places you can go to. It's very different mm. as well from place to place. So um, I, yeah, I'm excited. I, yeah, I've, well, I mean, both of us. N- nobody has really been overseas in, in so long I anyway. Know. So you know, it, it's got that element as well, which is um, which is exciting. It's crazy that we're even talking about this. To be perfectly honest, I, I'm just so excited. Yeah, I mean, international travel is actually possible again. I know. It feels like it's fantastic. Yeah, it just feels like nothing has happened in so many years. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, well, it'll be good. It's just yeah. Well, we've essentially just had. Two two great years of our you know of our twenties just nabbed. Yeah. Just, sorry, <laughs> gone. I feel really sorry. One of my friends uh, is uh, I think twenty, so she's had she had her she had eighteen and years eighteen and nineteen taken away. Yeah, that's due to rough. COVID. Uh, that's for just as you get your freedom, you're an adult, and, <laughs> uh. and then bang, COVID comes along, and no, nah, we're gonna take those two years. Sorry. Oh, you, what's that? You wanted to party? What's that? You wanted to travel? Yeah, oh, it's, my bad. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, that's like the golden age between high school and before you have to start kind of adopting some level of responsibility. <laughs> After yeah. you get into your 20s, you start to think, man, I really can't be wasting my life anymore. <laughs> yeah, I got to set myself up. I need a job. I need a house. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but no, um, it will be very, I'm very, very excited. I think the way I want to do it, is we'll maybe start with the the meeting because the I think the the meeting will yep. also be a little bit of work for us because we'll be un- undoubtedly we'll be recording content as well yeah. while we're there. So I reckon we go Omaha, go to the meeting, then go down to Texas, and then I reckon if we can across to um, to Florida. Maybe mm-hmm. go to a theme park, maybe check out some Miami real estate. And then <laughs> if we're really lucky, 
end in the Bahamas. <laughs> and all these Does houses are for sa- sale? <laughs> Sorry? And all these houses are for, you know, that bit in, uh, in the big shot where they're driving through, they're driving oh, through yeah. Miami, I think it is. And there's that every is- house is for sale and there's just nobody there. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I f- completely forgot about that. What do you that. mean? I thought you said you had two houses. I have eight <laughs> or something. Yeah, I have five houses and a condo. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> yep, there's a bubble. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. Actually, I watched that movie with my uh, with my parents the other day. Oh, right. Yeah, I said, we got to watch it. It's a great movie. Um, yeah, they didn't. Uh, I think they enjoyed it, but my mum didn't. I don't think she grasped all of the all the concepts in there, but so they still enjoyed it. Yeah, it's a bit but, of a nerdy um, one, but it it's is. great. I it need is. to watch it it's again. It's still a good movie. It is. Yeah, it is. It, it is with the explanations as well throughout. They do a good job mm. of even if you can't really um, keep up with the whole thing, you can kind of get an idea of, of what they're talking about in certain areas because of that. So, um, mm. that's good that they kind of dumb it down a little bit because it's just insanely complex. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. But yes, Florida, apparently, uh, is it Miami? Yeah. The real, got really nice real estate. It'd be kind of cool to go see some houses and then man, I've never been to the Bahamas. So that'd be pretty cool. But geez, that's uh, quite ambitious, isn't it? Yeah. I see. Well, I'm just looking at the States and I'm like, oh, that's not hard. It's just from the middle of the United States. You go down to Texas and across is probably like <laughs> <laughs> many thousands of miles. Yeah. And <laughs> we're <travel>. broke. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thousands, and thousands of dollars later. But anyway, we'll see. We'll see. But man, I am keen, keen as a bean in a lean cuisine to wow. go to America. Yeah. Nah, that'll be great. Um, anyway. Back to the podcast, eh? I'm yeah, just looking at Google Maps right now. <laughs> we got a lot to. We actually we don't have a lot. We got a little bit to talk about. Mm. Uh, we'll talk uh, about Disney's earnings. Disney uh, released their earnings. Very interesting their mm. earnings, and then uh, a couple of uh, interesting interview from the Nissan COO about the new European uh, emissions rules and their strategy in Europe. And Peloton, what the heck's going on with Peloton? We'll have to find out. Mm. So, with that said. Should we get started? Mm. Today's episode is sponsored by ShareSite, which is an application you can use to track the performance of your stock portfolio. So you can bring in all of your trades either automatically by connecting your broker or you can do it manually one by one or by downloading your trades from your broker through Excel. Uh, And once you bring them all in, uh, it will track all of your gains and losses uh, that you experience in your portfolio. So capital gains, dividends. If you have dividend reinvestment plans on your ETFs or on individual stocks, it will calculate all of those for you regardless of what type of dividend reinvestment plan it is as well, which is fantastic. Uh, Currency gains, if you're buying shares internationally or hold foreign currencies, that one is super important given the uh, inflationary environment right now and interest rate changes in different areas. uh, There's going to be big swings uh, or there very well could be big swings in in foreign currency, um, let's say between the US and Australian dollar. So, tracking those changes is super important. And then the main reason why I've been using ShareSite uh, for I think four or five years now is for when it comes to tax time. So ShareSite generates up to 12 different reports that can be used to track the performance of your portfolio as well as use the tax time to work out things such as capital gains, dividend income, and more. Uh, at the moment, you can try ShareSite for free by heading over to sharesite.com forward slash young investors. That's site spelled S-I-G-H-T, sharesite.com forward slash young investors. Use that link, sign up to a free plan, track up to 10 holdings for as long as you want. Uh, or you can also use that link to get four months off a yearly subscription. If you want to sign up for more premium features. So, go check it out if you're interested. All right. We should- um, Where to start? Yeah. Just a little little tidbit. I know you don't like me talking about inflation, but we have to, okay? It's important, <laughs> yeah, Brandon. It's, 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 <laughs> it, it is. It is. All right. It's just, a, it's just a little one, okay? This week, next week will be the, the one where I talk for half an hour on it. So, oh my <laughs> gosh. <laughs> all right. No, all right. but um, it, so inflation data comes out for January 2022 tomorrow. So, by the time you're listening to this, uh, it'll, it'll be out. Um, I'm oh, pretty sure. Okay. Um, but for us, it's not. So, um, I thought we could just look at, you know, what the expectation is and then maybe we can make a fun, non, non-real prediction. Um, <laughs> but uh, the expectation at the moment, I, I thought the expectation was that it was going to slow down, but it's actually still 
at a quite a high rate. The month over month rate is expected to be 0.4% um, up, uh, which is compared to 0.5% last month. So a slight decline, I guess, a slight slowdown. Um, but that would still bring year over year inflation to 7.2% in the US, which is higher than the year over year rate um, from the previous month. So Wow. Uh, that's the expectation going into tomorrow. Of course, um, who knows if that's you know going to ha- come true or anything. But uh, I thought, yeah, we, w- w- let's make a little prediction. What do you think? Do you think it'll be higher? Let's just focus on Ooh. maybe the year over year number. Do you think the year over year will be higher or lower than 7%, which is what it came in last month? Uh, look, I, I, I'm i just looking at the trend and I don't know enough to bet against the trend. So, I'm going to say it's it's going to be up. Um, how much? Jeez, I got no idea. Mm. I, I think, honestly, what, the last couple of months has gone up by 0.2 each time. So, yeah, I don't know. I'd probably anticipate maybe somewhere around 7, 7.1. So I, I actually would probably agree with the with what wherever this, this kind of estimate comes from. Mm. Um, I can't imagine it would, it would, it's, it seems to be slowing a little bit, but I don't know. It, month to month, who knows? It could change, but uh, yeah, I'd, I'd probably agree with 7.2, 7.1, 7.2, something like that. Yeah. Just to pluck a number out of my butt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I would probably think it would be higher than 7% just because of what, Jerome Powell said a couple of weeks ago where he was asked, is it getting better or worse? And he said, it's uh, similar or worse, I think was the, the phrase he said, or it's yeah. like the same or worse. Um, so, that seems to indicate that, you know, I, I don't know why you would say worse unless that it actually was worse. So, um, yeah, I, I yeah. don't see any evidence that shows we're going in the other direction yet. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, there's still a lot of problems. Supply chain issues, um, low employment, um, high demand for workers. So, we'll see. We'll see what happens. But uh, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if this is this is 7.2, 7.3, 7.4. So, we'll see. Yeah. But the market was um, the market was up. Uh, futures were up actually on on expectations um, today. So mm. the market is kind of positive about it, I guess. Although I guess the market is still down a lot from where it was recently, but. Yeah. Who knows? Interesting. Yeah. It's uh, it's funny doing this podcast on uh, on a Thursday when it releases on a Saturday. Sometimes we just get a scoop. Sometimes we just get something something big that comes out. Other times we just don't quite make it. And it's one of those times where we just haven't quite made it to, to getting the number. But we'll be able to talk about what the actual number was next mm. week. And uh, by the time this goes out, you can just literally just type it into Google what's uh, year-over-year inflation in the United States and you will see what number it actually is. But we will cover it next week, I'm sure. Mm-hmm. Um, all right. Should we talk about Disney? Yeah, take us through Disney. This is what we all want to oh, hear for gosh. this week. <laughs> this is interesting, actually. Mm. I, I, I really enjoy what – I think I enjoy looking into Disney because it's just, it's just a fun – company like everything they do is just in the interests of making people have fun yeah. making people happy um i really just like business like i like netflix it's like their product is just about making people happy having a good time you know yeah i found it so easy to just dive into netflix because it's a relatively simple business and it is yeah it's such a consumer you know? yeah i found it so easy as you can relate to just as a as yeah. a consumer who enjoys film and and tv so. yeah yeah. Content. Yeah, exactly right. Yeah. So, and and Disney, while it's not quite as simple, I would say, as Netflix, there's a lot of moving parts in, in Disney. It's a, it's a big, big, big company. Um, they do try and break it down as best they can. Um, so, I guess we'll just go through it and we'll, we'll see where we get to. But some very interesting news. Just straight up off the bat, the stock jumped eight mm. percent after after their earnings were released. So investors uh, were definitely happy with whatever was in their results. So, um, with that said, let's have a look what was actually in there. So, in terms of uh, Disney's reporting, so they used to report like was it three or four categories? It was four. like four categories. Then it was three categories, and now it's two categories. <laughs> <laughs> So, they report Disney media and entertainment distribution as one category of revenue. And then they report Disney parks, experiences and products as the other segment. So, it's pretty much all the content 
gets lumped into one segment and then all of the physical theme parks, the physical products, the cruise ships, that gets lumped into the into the second uh, segment. So, mm. uh, in terms of Disney media and entertainment distribution, that first segment, they uh, had a 15 15- percent uh, increase in revenue from 12.7 billion to 14.6 billion uh, that's uh, year over year uh, numbers then for Disney parks experiences and products their revenue rose very very dramatically <laughs> from 3.6 billion to 7.2 billion year over year so um, I wrote it down da, 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 da. revenue was up 101.6 percent so uh, year over year which is very very impressive. Um, which, as we'll talk about later, is because, what do you know, their theme parks are back open. (laughs) Um, That'll do it. (laughs) Yeah, so that led to overall revenue of uh, $21.8 billion for the quarter, which is a 34% rise year over year. But revenue is kind of one part of the story. Of course, it's the top line. If we go down to the bottom line, we look at, uh, well, not even the bottom line, but if we just look at uh, operating income, then uh, unfortunately, the Disney media and entertainment distribution has dropped 44% in their operating income year over year. Mm. Um, and their and the Disney parks experiences and products has uh, risen. It was negative $119 million. So, it was eating $119 million. And now it is generating $2.45 billion in operating income, which is- wow. Quite the turnaround year over year. So, I'm sure that the the Disney investors will be very happy to see that turnaround Um, because they would have been sweating a little bit during COVID (laughs) with all the shutdowns of the theme parks and whatnot. Um, Yeah. I mean, all all I was going to say was, I mean, Disney's brand is so powerful. It would be hard to imagine that after the shutdowns, there wasn't going to be a a significant return to to their theme Mm. parks. So. Um, you know, that's kind of the the benefit of looking for companies with that powerful advantage. Then you can be confident, okay, even though there's a shutdown, even though they're losing money on this, um, if they have a good balance sheet, then they can ride it out and customers will come back. Mm. Yep. And that's exactly what happened. Um, so, with that said, so overall, their uh, operating income went up from $1.3 billion to $3.3 billion mm. uh, year over year, which is a very impressive rise. So, with that kind of overview out of the way, I thought we'd start going a little bit deeper into the Disney media and entertainment distribution, the first mm. segment first, and then we'll talk about what's going on with the parks and experiences and products in a little bit. So, um, in terms of media and entertainment distribution or pretty much Disney content, the content side of their business, um, there was a uh, 34% revenue growth in direct consumer and a 43% growth in content sales and licensing. Mm. But unfortunately, no growth in their TV networks and their broadcasting side of their business, which is the biggest revenue segment of the category. Um, And then in terms of operating income for this one revenue segment, there was a 13% reduction in their TV networks to $1.5 billion. Uh, Then direct-to-consumer operating loss grew 27% versus this quarter last year to uh, to $593 million loss. Um, and content sales and licensing ate 98 million compared to producing 188 million in the comparable quarter last year. So, yeah, there you go. Um, I thought, uh, what, what have I written here? Uh, oh, yeah, that's right. Overall, so overall, this segment of their revenue is so confusing. We have to dive in layer by layer. <laughs> overall, this segment saw a 44% decline in operating income year over year from $1.4 billion to $808 million. Right. Um, but, yeah, so this is obviously, you know, uh, broadcasting, TV networks, direct-to-consumer, um, all their content. So, of course, while we're here, I thought we'd hone in a little bit and talk about more direct to consumer because mm. that's really what everyone's looking at. Yeah, well, I think I guess it's not really surprising that there's no growth in their their TV networks. We'll probably expect to see those get can- cannibalized by streaming services yeah. consistently over time. So, 
Um, I, I guess that's probably what makes Disney a little bit more difficult to assess because you have to kind of factor in um, the growth of say Disney plus and ESPN plus these streaming services and then kind of balance it with a decline somewhat or maybe entirely of um, their their licensing of content to, to network so um, mm. yeah it's kind of a it's kind of a tricky balancing game at least I found that when I was trying to figure out maybe what it's worth yeah it's it's definitely like a transition it's a change in the business model one yeah. kind of area is transitioning to a different area yeah. as everything goes direct to consumer um so with that said let's talk direct to consumer uh the biggest one of course is disney plus their biggest streaming service uh and maybe you can give some uh some context as to how this compared to netflix we we're talking about netflix not too long ago mm. Uh, Disney Plus, they added 11.7 million subscribers quarter over quarter, cool. and they are now up to 129.8 million paid subscribers. Uh, mm. So, this time last year, they had 95 million subscribers, yeah. which is, uh, I would say, pretty impressive growth. I mean, they're still smaller. They can maybe grow a little bit more rapidly, but uh, that's still pretty impressive growth, I would say. Oh, yeah. Um, they've, they've outshined. Sorry, I cut you off there. No, that's all right. I was just going to move on. Say what you were going to say because then I was going to move on to other stats. Yeah, so. yeah. I mean, they've just they've obviously uh, outshined pretty much every other streaming service in terms of their growth. Um, so, in the last quarter, Netflix, I think, increased their um, subscribers by about 8 million. So, you know, a couple less than, um, than Disney there. And then on a year over year basis, it looks like Disney did about 35 million. Whereas, uh, what did Netflix do? Uh... Yeah, I think if you average Netflix, sure. uh, yeah, I think last year they did quite a lot less. I think maybe 17 or 18 or 20 million or something like that. Right. I okay. think the, yep. the thing was, if you average it with 2020, where they had that boom, um, mm. it was about 27 was their average, but I would have to have a look at Disney's average uh, okay. to do that comparison. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, very, very interesting. I mean, it's good growth from Disney+. Plus. Uh, they also noted their average monthly revenue per user came in at $4.41. So, that's up 7% mm. quarter over quarter and 9% year over year. Um, but, of course, we can compare that to, I guess, Netflix and that sort of thing. But uh, that's only one part of the story for Disney because they also have two other streaming services. They have ESPN Plus and they also have Hulu. So, ESPN Plus, which is obviously a smaller sports branded streaming service, they added 4.2 million subscribers in the quarter, now up to 21.3 million paid subscribers at uh, $5.16 monthly revenue per customer. So, a little bit more revenue per user, but obviously far less paid subscribers. Mm. And then Hulu added 1.5 million subscribers, now up to 45.3 million paid users at uh, $12.96 of monthly revenue per user for streaming. So, just the streaming side of Hulu and then $87.01 for live TV combined with streaming. So, very hmm. interesting. Also, they noted uh, total programming and production costs for all of direct consumer was one, uh, sorry, one point three point one seven nine billion for the quarter, up six percent quarter over quarter, and up thirty three percent year over year. So that includes, uh, obviously, yes, production costs for all of their content, uh, but also the, uh, I guess the the costs to do with the platforms themselves, the mm. programming costs. Uh, but it's still interesting to see, okay, how much money does it take to actually keep this these direct-to-consumer uh, products or services running? So, I'm not sure how that compares to Netflix. Um, I'd have to go in and look. But uh, interesting, they're spending $3.179 billion per quarter. It's quite a lot. Yeah, I don't. I don't have the numbers to kind of do a direct comparison. That they might also break down that number differently. Um, yeah, into, true. Into different lines. They but, probably. Yeah. Um, yeah. Very, very, very interesting. Um, their average uh, revenue per customer or per per month per customer of four dollars and forty one for Disney Plus is a lot lower than Netflix, and they really employed mm. the same strategy as Netflix, which was to start their pricing really, really low, and then to. Uh, introduce progressive increases over time, um, which yeah. seems to be the the right approach um, for yep. this market. And it's what they're doing as well. So that was always you can read read about the content, the um, the pricing strategy for Disney Plus. It was always going to be an undercut uh, Netflix, mm. get more subscribers, and then over time, slowly 
slowly raise prices as the as the platform gets more filled out, um, I guess. And that's exactly what they're doing, and it seems to be working for them. Yeah. Um, so that is, uh, I think, what I all I had to say for uh, direct to consumers. Um, other thing, the only other thing I was going to say was, you know, yes, they're not obviously making any money from it. There's no profit coming from direct to consumer, but I wouldn't worry about that if you're a shareholder because this is basically exactly what they said would happen. Uh, if you rewind, I think it was like 2020, they did a, a big in, in direct consumer investor day presentation and they pretty much said exactly that this was going to happen. So, it's kind of in line with what they were they were talking about back then. Yeah. Um, with these kind of businesses, you really can't just focus on current profitability because like I've spoken about with Netflix, Every time they increase the the uh, the price per month for customers by just a dollar, given their current subscriber base, not even any increases, that's two point seven billion dollars of additional basically cash flow because it doesn't <laughs> yeah. cost them anything to raise the price. That's two point seven yeah. billion dollars in cash flow that they just add incrementally every single year from a dollar increase. So Netflix, uh, yeah. Disney has, has clearly got very likely assuming that they can uh, retain their audience in the same way that Netflix does. Um, they ha probably have a significant way to go in increasing that monthly revenue per user from $4. Yeah. You know, if you can imagine this like $5 there, then that's, that's quite a lot more uh, incremental yeah. revenue on their 120 million subscribers. So they've got quite a way to go there. The other interesting thing about Disney is their, their hot star Disney plus, which is their Indian package. Um, mm. I think they have about 40 million subscribers subscribers because they actually break that out, um, which uh, Netflix doesn't break out their Indian market, which would have been nice. We could do an Apple to Apple's comparison. But uh, I think I think uh, Disney had about 40 million um, subscribers yep. there. And 45.9 um, million. There you yep. go. So that's going to be a really interesting market because there's obviously a lot of customers there. Um, I think there's like in the next couple of years, there'll be a total of 900 million people with access to the internet. But wow. at the same, is that right? Yeah. So I, I think I, crazy. there was another crazy stat. It was like over the last three years, half a billion people have gained access to the internet in India. It's a really rapidly, yeah. they're really going through that, that, um, that portion of, of change. Um, yeah. But the other thing about the Indian market is there is a lot of people there, but it's also very, very low revenue. I think they're, I think Disney yeah, is true. currently about a dollar or a dollar 50 per subscriber. Cable TV, which in the US is you know sixty to eighty dollars per month, mm. is is three dollars fifty or three dollars in India. And Disney's, uh, sorry, Netflix just dropped their price for their low, um, their lowest um, plan to to about three dollars as well. So um, there's probably an opportunity to capture a lot of subscribers there, but those subscribers hey, Rashid, might be worth you know a substantial amount less each. Yeah, you know the stats. I've actually got the spreadsheet right in front of me <laughs> as we speak. And yeah, Disney Plus Hotstar, the Indian offering, one dollar and three cents average revenue. I'm telling you, per I, user. I've been I've been obsessed with this space for a little while now. Yeah, well, fair enough. It's very interesting, and it's a uh, you know it's a, a big it's a big space for for the future, like the streaming. Anything related to content, streaming, however, which way it's even you think about YouTube, you know, any which way content is delivered, content is a big industry, you know. Yeah. So, fair enough that you're, you're diving into it. But, yeah, very interesting. Um, I like your thoughts. I, 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 I fully agree. All right. Um, so, that, that was direct to consumer. So, or direct to consumer within Disney media and entertainment distribution. Are you keeping up? I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, let's put that revenue category aside and let's now talk about Disney parks, experiences and products. Um, and as I said before, so revenue for this entire category was up 101.6%. Mm. Um, and they also saw the, the very strong return uh, to operating profits of 2.45 billion compared to 640 million in Q3 21 and a negative 119 million in Q4 last year. And what's interesting is that um, they've actually just this quarter, they have crossed past the last pre-pandemic operating income for Parks Experiences oh, and wow. Products. So, they are back, baby. They are <laughs> ahead. They are ahead of pre-pandemic now, which is crazy. 
Yeah. And I mean, I guess that makes sense. Like you would expect there to be a, a surge in demand um, coming out of the pandemic. Everyone wants yeah. to everyone wants to just do things physically um, for a little while, I think now. So it was debate, though. There was debate for a while. I, we were sitting on the side of, you know, um, we think yeah. there's going to be a lot of demand. But there were a lot of people that were saying, is there going to be? Yeah, demand? Would- Will people want to go to these crowded theme parks when we're still dur- like in a pandemic? They could That's catch true. COVID and this sort of stuff. That is true. I mean, people were still saying that about uh, international travels. Like, is it going to bounce back strong? Will people want to travel? There's a pandemic going. And obviously now we know that just everybody <laughs> wants to get the hell out of Dodge. So, <laughs> yeah, it's kind of, it's kind of, yeah, it's, it's kind of the idea of um, how long do, do, if humans do something for, for, you know, two years straight, will that just become the new normal? Is that, is that just going to be the, the habit, right? It is kind of the story about um, whether there will be an accelerated um, transition to, to people working out of the office or whether, you know, people will mostly just go back and then the transition will kind of continue to happen slowly. Um, it's, yeah, it's kind of that idea as well. Um, mm. It's, uh, yeah, it's very fascinating to, to watch it play out. And I guess we're still kind of in the midst of it, so we don't really know. I mean, we might see a surge of travel and then maybe people do travel less um, because we've just been in this mode for so long. I, I don't know. Maybe. Who, who knows? But I think what you brought up before, just briefly at the, at the top, was... Um was a very good point in that if your company has a big fat moat of some description like a Disney, mm. then that does definitely like there is just a baseline demand of people that want to go to Disneyland. Yeah. <laughs> and I think that's very powerful. And obviously that moat has helped them tremendously to bounce back to now stronger operating income from their parks business than even what they were seeing in the last quarter before the pandemic mm. hit. So, um, a very, very, you know, strong example of how important a moat is. But with that said, um, so yes, their theme parks are, are back open again. They said in their uh, earnings release, quote, our domestic parks and resorts were open for the entire current quarter, whereas Disneyland Resort was closed for all of the prior year quarter and Mm -hmm. Walt Disney World Resort operated at reduced capacity due to the mandatory COVID-19 restrictions. The increased operating income at our international parks and resorts was due to growth at Disneyland Paris and Hong Kong Disneyland Resort. Disneyland Paris was open for the entire current quarter, while only open for 26 days in the prior year quarter. Hong Kong Disneyland Resort was open for 68 days in the current quarter compared to 42 days in the prior year quarter. So... Hmm. I mean, honestly, just as a, as a neutral onlooker, I'm not a shareholder of Disney anymore. I was, but I'm not now. Um, it just makes me so happy to see that these parks are back open and and people are just really keen to go. And the, the, it really something that will definitely please Disney shareholders is that in their earnings report, they even quoted that they have seen increased average guest spending. Oh. Increase. So people are going, not only they're just going back to Disneyland, like, oh, maybe they needed to cut the ticket prices in half just to encourage people to go back. No, 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 no. People are paying more than they would have normally done to go to Disneyland and all the other Disney kind of Disney resort properties. So it says here, quote, guest spending uh, growth was due to an increase in average per capita ticket revenue, higher average uh, daily hotel room rates, and an increase in food, beverage, and merchandise spending. Um, so I, I don't know. That is, they, they are some promising signs for Disney shareholders that um, the parks business is 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 back in action. Mm. Uh, I think a lot of a lot of shareholders will be very happy to see that people are coming back, and not only are they coming back, they're happy, they're comfortable with even spending more than what they were before. Yeah, it is. Uh, it is kind of crazy. I mean, every time we've seen it, pretty much every single earnings result we've seen just recently has been this kind of same idea of 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 people spending more cost inflation just uh, just in general um inflation really <laughs> that's that's yeah, pushing yeah. on either the revenue side or pushing on the the cost side so um yeah it's 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 crazy but i, I guess it, i guess it makes sense we're, we're still riding the high of 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 people being generally on average more cashed up than prior to the pandemic um and now having this uh this desire to kind of go out and spend it all so it makes sense yep 
And even some of their cruise ships are running again. Oh, God. I'm never going on another cruise again. <laughs> oh, I've had such a bad experience. Oh, just ca- trying to cancel our cruises with all the COVID <laughs> stuff. Oh, my gosh. That was, that was a nightmare. Anyway, that's a, that's a story for another day. But anyway, that is Disney. Mm. Very happy story for Disney shareholders. It's kind of um, a little bit related to that. I thought we could do this little story on, um, on News Corp and Foxtel because uh, I guess it's kind of pretty much is in the same space. Um, we in the ha- content space? Yeah, it is in the content space. And I, I had some... I want to get your thoughts on this because I have some, I have some mixed feelings about... Foxtel, um, right. which, uh, so those who don't know, Foxtel is Australia's largest cable TV provider. It's essentially cable TV. And uh, they have uh, 3.9 million paid subscribers, uh, or they did at the end of the year when they reported their half yearly results. Um, and the headline of the article I was reading which was uh, News Corp is uh, very co- apparently confident in uh, Foxtel despite of course they despite are. weak results, <laughs> which is uh, really interesting. So I think News Corp and uh, Telstra, Telstra, Tesla yeah. there. <laughs> have uh, Telstra have a, a joint venture in um, in in Foxtel, which is the uh, the cable TV provider. Um, but then they also have a, a number of uh, streaming services, which they've kind of um, birthed over the past couple of years as a result of this boom in in streaming mm-hmm. services. But uh, revenue for Foxtel uh, for the half year fell three uh, percent to seven hundred million dollars. And uh, really the key result here was uh, because of people transitioning from traditional cable subscriptions to Foxtel streaming services, which of course right. generate significantly less revenue. <laughs> um, right. For, but they're confident in the results. They're, com- they're confident. <laughs> oh, There's an amazing quote in a second. I'm just going to get to. Um, but yeah, so Foxtel has actually three streaming services. They have, what is it? Foxtel, I really can't remember the name now. Foxtel Now or Foxtel Go. I can't remember which one right. it is. It's one of those, okay? Um, uh, which is uh, just basically a mobile version of their their uh, live TV. And then they also have KO, which is um, their live sports streaming service. And then Binge, which is where all the TV and film um, is, is kind of hosted. And uh, all of that content, as far as I'm aware... Uh, or at least the vast majority of it is just licensed from American media companies. Mm. So Binge, for yeah. example, um, <laughs> they have a massive deal. Um, well, Foxtel has a massive deal with uh, Warner Media, which owns HBO and obviously all of the other um, content that comes under the the Warner umbrella. Yeah. Um, and as a result, they can uh, show those shows on on their pay TV uh, on Foxtel. Uh, and then they can also show them on Binge. And that's kind of their their business model, which I mean, has been the business model for other streaming services as well um, for, mm. you know, for a long time, right? Having these kind of deals. Um, yeah. But, uh, you know, I think my concern is with the rise of these, all of these streaming services. I mean, now you have HBO Max in the US, right? So HBO WarnerMedia essentially is... Uh, has their own streaming service where they're putting their own content out. Um, my concern is what's really to stop Warner from eventually not signing a new deal with Foxtel and just offering HBO Max in Australia. <laughs> Absolutely nothing. Hey, Mishota, that's the answer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, nothing, nothing is stopping them from doing that. So, I was that. wondering this and I was like, <laughs> I, I wanted to look up, okay, maybe they have a perpetual license or maybe it's really long. So, this isn't a concern or something. Um, and they actually did sign a license deal with Warner Media recently. So, in 2020, they signed a multi-year deal, although they didn't disclose how many years the deal is. They just said multi-year. So, I don't know what that is, three, five years, I would imagine. Um to continue licensing all of its media content to Foxtel. So, at least for the next few years, um, Foxtel is, is fine. They can continue to, to show HBO show, get, you know, exclusive HBO shows essentially for Australians. Um, even the new mm. ones that they create that are exclusive for HBO Max. Um, but yeah, I, I just, I don't know. I guess maybe it's a, maybe it's an easier business model for, for Warner just to get the generate the licensing revenue rather than generate subscription revenue. But I don't know. I, I would imagine they mm. would want to move towards something like what Netflix does, which is they have a service everywhere and Netflix just doesn't show. M- Netflix might have some licenses for some shows that they can um, display in the US, but if they can't display them in Australia, they just won't appear on the Netflix Australia um, uh, platform. So, I don't know, but 
a quote from the CEO was, we are increasingly confident in Foxtel's future and thus actively looking for ways to maximize its value and ensure that we can build on that success. What the hell, yeah, nah. what the hell does that mean? I, I, I don't what buy is it. That? What is the, that? The way I see it is this is just the general rule that I apply in the content realm. Hmm. It's like, if you own the content, you're good. If you don't own the content, it's only a matter of time before you're stuffed. <laughs> and that's exactly the problem that Netflix was presented with a few years ago. Yeah. And they realized that. They said, hmm, okay, people are now doing what we're doing, but we don't own any content. So, they changed their business. That's the, what's, what we've been talking about with Netflix for the last forever is how they changed their business to start making their own original content. And it's, it looks like they've really dug themselves out of a potential very big hole. But yeah, I mean, there's there's hope because um, I guess uh, Rupert Murdoch controls a lot of uh, content as well. So, some of the content will, will always kind of you know, if, if news, uh, uh, what's it, what's it called? News Corp. Yep. If they have a, a stake in Foxtel, there'll always be that kind of that link there. Um, but yeah, you're right. I mean, in terms of other platforms coming to Australia, it's only a matter of time. It's only a matter of time. And yes, they'll want exclusive, uh, you know, they'll want to show their own content exclusively on their own platform. So yeah, exactly. If, if, if you don't make your own content, then you're in trouble. I think it's only a matter of time. Yeah. But, uh, and I mean, their business model, which I presume, I, I don't think they broke out whether it was profit, whether Foxhell was profitable, but um, you would presume it was profitable, um, you know, at, at some point, hopefully. But that's, you know, a relationship between these huge pay TV subscriptions and the licensing fees. And now you're going to see a significant drop in revenue because people are not going to be paying that much for for, for those channels um, and possibly an increase in the, the licensing fees as, as uh, Warner will be able to and the other media companies will be able to flex their muscles and, and demand more because what else can Foxtel do? They can only take that deal. The alternative is they make their own content, which they've n- I'm pretty sure they've never done that before. So, mm. uh, yeah, or, or as you said, they have those some probably some media assets through through News Corp. But um, yeah. Yeah, it's uh, uh it, it's a pickle. It is a, it is a bit of a pickle, and um, yeah, I don't know what they're going to do about it. Yeah, Netflix was very on top of the idea that they would have to transition into original content. I was listening to the CEO talk, and um, he said that even from the very early days, the early two thousands, the path for what they would become was pretty clear because pretty much every media company, including Disney, started by licensing other content before then going into original content themselves. That's pretty much how every media company starts. Um, So, the path was kind of laid out quite early for them. And they even tried to do original content with their physical DVDs uh, back when they were delivering them, um, which is kind of funny. They would find productions and and film them and then put them onto DVDs and they did did terribly. Um, So, they stopped doing it. (laughs) But that, that that was kind of their their path for for a long time, um, but yeah. There's, then there's these businesses like Foxhell, and you have to imagine there that has to be the direction they go, or else you know, f- you know, up until now they've had this huge monopoly, but uh, on pay TV essentially, and all of the good channels from the US. Um, but that might be that might be about that to might go be away. Changing. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree. I would be nervous. <laughs> I would not be confident. I would be nervous. <laughs> mm. Tell um, us about uh, this uh, this Nissan thing. Do you want, or do you want to talk about Peloton? I can go back. We can talk about Nissan. Ah. This is just a quick thing that I found. Um, okay, I can talk about. It. It's very. It says Nissan COO says new European emissions rules will make combustion engines unviable, which is pretty oh, interesting. Okay. Um, yeah, uh, it's interesting that they just came out and said that. So, it says, the chief operating officer of Nissan on Tuesday explained that his company has decided to move away from the development of new ICE en- oh, yeah, internal combustion engines in Europe once a tougher set of emissions standards known as Euro 7 come into force. 
During an interview with CNBC's Squawkbox Europe, Ashwani Gupta laid out uh, some of the reasons behind the planned shift, a subject he has addressed a number of times in the past. A key reason behind the decision, Gupta said, uh, related to how competitive ICE cars would be following the introduction of Euro 7, given that new technology would have to be used for these vehicles to comply with regulations. Uh, Another factor to consider was whether customers would be willing to pay for the cost of such tech. So, very interesting that if to meet these new Euro 7 regulations when they come into force, they would actually have to redesign and, you know, completely go back to the drawing board and make new engines to be able to comply. So, um, yeah, so they're kind of saying, look, is this really worth it anymore? So, this is just an example where um, governments, lawmakers have been able to put put enough pressure on, uh, on, you know, emissions and ice cars where they're actually saying, no, I think an ice car is unviable, which is wow. quite interesting. That is fascinating. Yeah, yeah it, is, it is interesting to kind of see the dynamic of how regulations change, particularly in Europe, you often see um, these changes come through first before, oh, before any of these changes yeah, go yeah, yeah. through um, yeah. in, say, the US. And then I guess it's a question of whether you obviously don't want to push too hard on businesses because you want to give them you, you don't want them obviously to go out of business before they can make a change that's positive, right? Um, you wouldn't want these businesses to be like, oh, well, this this change actually means we can't even operate. Yeah, like, pack it we in. don't actually have enough <laughs> money to make this pivot right now. Um, so, yeah, I guess it's kind of a balancing act of, of that. Um, but mm. very interesting to see um, that uh, what, what Nissan is saying out of here. Mm. Says here, according to Brussels headquartered campaign group Transport and Environment, it's expected that Euro 7 standards will be implemented in 2025. Right. Um, from Gupta's comments, it would appear Nissan has made up its mind on how the market will develop and European uh, consumers will behave going forward. Quote, if the total cost of ownership of a battery electric car um, at Euro 7 is less than the total cost of ownership for ICE cars, then definitely custom- customers will go for battery cars. So, that's why we've decided not to develop ICE engines uh, starting from Euro 7 for Europe. Uh, last November, Nissan said it would invest 2 trillion Japanese yen, which is $17.3 billion over the next five years to speed up the electrification of its product line. The company said it would aim to roll out 23 new electrified models by 2030, 15 of which would be fully electric. It's targeting 50% electrification mix for its Nissan and Infinity brands by the end of the decade. Um, mm. Yeah, so there you go. There you go. But that is very – just an interesting – uh, story because you can you can imagine that this is only going to continue. You know, we talk about how mm. uh, ICE cars are going to be banned. You know, the sale of new internal combustion engines are going to be ba- banned in certain countries and then more countries jump on board, whatever their timelines are. And now you see here where they're actually putting the clamps on just through tougher emissions standards. But you can, you just, this is not... The rev- you know, the trend is clear. The trend is clear what's going to happen. Like governments around the world are wanting to push the ICE vehicle out of existence and switch to battery electric cars. So, I mean, if Nissan can make the transition, then good on them for, for actually putting their hand up and saying, you know what, we do need to make this transition because still a lot of the car companies really not doing very much about it. <laughs> a lot of hesitancy, yeah, that's for sure. A lot of hesitancy, but uh, an interesting example. But uh, that was just a quick one. I want to hear what's going on with uh, with Peloton. Mm, yeah, there was a couple of things. I mean, I haven't I haven't really followed Peloton, to be honest, but um, the yeah, they've uh, they've had a bit of a wild- It's like the at-home gym equipment, right? Yeah, so they're, a, they're an exercise equipment. Well, they describe themselves as, as an exercise equipment and media company. So, they sell these, okay. they sell, um, yeah, at-home exercise bikes, uh, bicycles and treadmills. And it's the ones with the TVs, we've got the classes yeah, on there already. Yeah, exactly. There's a little social media yeah. in there and you can compete against people and- you pay a massive yep. subscription fee, I think. But, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but um, no, because they, they've been on a massive uh, roller coaster over the past couple of years. The stock went up 400% in 2020 um, on the back of, of course, stay at home orders and uh, people couldn't go to the gym. So they decided, let's, let's get mm. a little, let's get an exercise bike. We can all um, still stay healthy. I didn't do that, but. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still fine. And uh, now, uh, well, uh, unfortunately, this is the unfortunate thing was that uh, the founder 
was extremely optimistic uh, towards investors that sales would continue to rise out of 2020. Um, oh, that okay. even though there was a short-term demand, that there was even more demand coming down. And he was a salesman. He was a salesman. Yeah, he 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 put on that. He put on the sales cap and and told investors that things were going to continue to grow, and um, they didn't. So when growth Oof. slowed, uh, the stock of course collapsed. It's now down 85 percent from its highs which is, uh, yikes, that's painful. 85%. Yeah. It's, it's oh. pretty much, I, as far as I'm aware, I didn't check exactly, but I think it's around where it was before 2020. So I think, geez, yeah. that's a flipping cruise line in a global pandemic. That is. Yeah. It's a, that's a, that's a downturn for sure. Um, insane, insane stuff. So on the back of that, there's been some changes that have happened to Peloton um, starting over the past couple of weeks. Um, the founder and CEO, John Foley, has now stepped down this week as CEO. Um, he'll remain executive chairman. Of course, he's still a significant owner in the company, um, but he won't be the, the he won't be steering the ship, I guess. Although, right. I mean, he kind of still will be. It's, it, it's more of a, uh, I mean, I guess he's not in the executive role, but he will probably still have quite a lot of communication, I would imagine, with the new CEO. Right, right. Um, it's kind of like Jeff Bezos isn't the CEO anymore. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, maybe his role will be a little bit less day-to-day, um, just being on the... Well, I mean, he's an executive chairman, so he still is in the day-to-day of the business, but yeah, yeah. not in that chief executive position. But uh, this also came after the company cut 2,800 staff this week um, because they expanded their business too quickly. Of course, they thought that demand was going to continue to increase and they were ramping up their business and then the demand just didn't come. So, um, they have to lay off a bunch of staff to, to save their business, Oof. which hurts. Um, and then, uh, so then we have Barry McCarthy, who is uh, replacing the founder as CEO. Uh, and he was a previous uh, chief financial officer at Netflix and Spotify. So, Oh. He's had some uh, top level experience at uh, a number of successful businesses and uh, now he's yeah. coming over to Peloton to to steer the ship. And um, there's there a go. couple of funny things that are, uh, <laughs> well, uh, I guess it's it's funny depending on where you, what position you're yeah, from. If, but, uh, if you're not a shareholder. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, if you're not an employee, let's just say, because uh, oh, okay. they, uh, they, last night they hosted a the CEO and uh, the founder hosted a virtual all hands meeting to introduce the new CEO to, to the employees of the company and talk mm. about the direction of the company, that sort of thing. And uh, unfortunately, uh, the conversation between McCarthy and former CEO John Fowley was abruptly cut short. Uh, this is what CNBC said, by the way, according to three mm. people familiar with the matter. Okay. According to three people familiar with the matter. Three. So they yeah, had they, one, two, three. Yeah, they've upped their game, right? <laughs> Not according to just people familiar yeah. with that. Three. No. So yeah. essentially they had this virtual Zoom meeting and a bunch of employees who were fired during the week got onto the call and oh, started no. to spam stuff in the in the chat. Um, things like there was a couple of quotes here. This is awfully tone deaf. <laughs> I'm selling all my Peloton apparel to pay my bills. <laughs> And a couple aye, of aye, others, aye. and eventually they just cut the meeting short, um, which was uh, which is uh, kind of uh, kind of funny. If uh, yeah, that's brutal. Yeah, so it's been rough. But the, I think the most exciting thing that came out of Peloton this week, uh, or at least it, I, I think it's exciting, is uh, the fact that with the stock down so much, uh, there might be a potential acquisition on the horizon. So- uh, I, Yeah, I heard something about this. Yeah. What's going on? And, and look, I think from what I read, it's it's very vague. I don't know. This could just be completely made up by these, uh, these um, journalists because all it said was, the Wall Street Journal reported on Friday that Amazon was interested. So, Amazon's interested, apparently. Right. Um, and then the Financial Times, a few hours later, said that Nike was evaluating a bid. So, you know, that's, mm, that's what we've got. We've got two companies that potentially um, might be making a bid, Amazon and Nike. And then this is the the least hopeful of all. Um, it just says here that uh, Wedbush analyst Dan Ives wrote in a note that he would be shocked if Apple is not aggressively involved in potential deal process. So that's just pure speculation by an analyst. Yep. Um, but if you're seeing Apple in the headline, that's why. <laughs> because of this one guy who speculated that he would be shocked. Oh. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah, true. I mean, that the Apple are 
making a big push into health and fitness. So I mean, it does yeah, make it sense. does make sense, right? Um, yeah, you can get some integration with your watch or with your iPhone. Uh, iPhone, then yeah, yeah, and they have that fitness subscription as a part of Apple plus exactly, or whatever it's yeah. called. Um, yeah. So if they can integrate that into the subscription that Peloton already has with their kind of social media, social exercising kind of community thing, then um, then yeah, that, that could make a lot of sense. And especially with stock down significantly now back to pre-pandemic levels, uh, potentially, mm. potentially there's an opportunity there. But uh, yeah. Well, there you go. There you go. Peloton. Yeah, that's so funny that that story about the the call. Yeah, that didn't go down <laughs> well. <laughs> oh, they would have been crapping their pants when they saw the people in the chat just shouting at them. Oh. And then, um, at, yeah, I didn't include it in the thing, but um, towards the end of the the call, um, someone asked, like, with their voice, someone asked the CEO, "Have former employees that have been fired gotten into this call?" And he goes, "No comment." <laughs> Like, oh. Surely that's not a. That's, that can't be the best response for that situation. Come on. Yeah. Anyway, but uh, yeah. There you no. go. Peloton's had it rough. I mean, I haven't even included everything that went wrong with Peloton. They had some serious inju- injuries that came out of their their treadmills. They had to recall. There's a. It's been a tough. It's been a tough year. Yeah. Oh dear. Anyway, poor old Peloton. Jeez. Yeah. People are just going to the gym again. <laughs> All right, should we do some Q&A? Yeah, we should. A couple we questions. Haven't, we haven't done Q&A in a little while, so we better uh, better do a couple. Yeah. Oh, this is a kind of uh, funny thing, uh, a funny question <laughs> that got asked on the last podcast. Uh, great podcast, guys. Have you ever considered adding video? Mm. Have we considered <laughs> adding video? Kind of, it's kind of, uh, that's kind of funny because dur- over the past couple of weeks, we've been talking about is, is there a way that we can uh, film the podcast uh, from week to week. Mm. Potentially. We'll, we'll, we'll say maybe. <laughs> we'll, we're, we're, maybe. We're definitely we're, considering it. Um, we're working we're, on yeah, it. Yeah, we're working on it. That's the right word. We're working on it. Yeah. And it, I mean, we have a couple of uh, video podcasts if you want to check them out. I think there's like five or six of them or something like that. So there you go. You can get a little sneak preview of what it... Well, I mean, it's not going to be like that, I guess, because nah, it's but, going to uh, be over Zoom, but... <laughs> yeah, yeah. But no, I think I think that would be really good, uh, and I think it would be good for the YouTube channel, the Young Investors Podcast YouTube channel. Yeah, I agree. Because at, at the moment, like all of our uh, listeners are, are just Spotify, Apple Podcasts, like the, the audio platforms. So if we wanted to actually make it good for YouTube as well, then I think that we should try and do it. But uh, yeah, that'll be. Uh, we'll see. We'll see what we can. We'll see what we can do. Mm. Um, Hey, there's another one that we got this week. Have you guys ever tried to get Phil Town on for an episode? Mm. I reckon that'd be awesome. Oh, yes, we have tried many, spot. many times. <laughs> it is a bit of a sore spot, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, we, we could we could try again at some point. We have I don't we haven't really reached out in a while, but yeah, a while back it would have been well over a year and a half ago or so. We we uh, we tried to get him on and uh, it didn't go down. So that's no. okay. We can. We can try again at some point. We'll try. We will we'll, we'll, we'll try. As as the, I think like, I don't even know what his YouTube channel's at at the moment. I don't know. I haven't seen really anything from him in a while. So. Yeah. He doesn't get, he doesn't get the same views that he used to get. Um, just let me have a look here. Phil Town. Oh, there you go. So I've actually passed him on subscribers <laughs> now. Wow. That is crazy because I used to have like, I remember I used to have like 50,000 subscribers and he was getting, I think he was just crossing like 300,000. So, yeah. Wow. Hey, that's crazy. His channel's really slowed down. Yeah. Um, so, may, I don't know. Maybe I can, Maybe that gives me more weight to throw around. Maybe I could potentially get him on now. Mm, but, uh, that's a we'll good point. We'll see. We'll see. Mm. Um, what else have we got here? Um, any other small ones? Oh, here's a quick one. Uh, what do you guys think about using Berkshire Hathaway as a stock for diversification? Treat it like an ETF. Do you have yeah, any thoughts that's on that? a. I think we've we've yeah. Um, I guess in some ways it's kind of like a blend of active and passive investing because a lot of Berkshire Hathaways. Um, uh, their businesses that they wholly own are kind of like they'll grow along with general kind of economic growth, insurance, mm. and Berkshire Hathaway Energy and, and that kind of stuff, railroad. Um, uh, 
And then, of course, they have a, a big stock portfolio, which covers, it obviously is very tailored towards certain businesses, but there's still a lot of positions in there. So, maybe you can argue that it's like a passive investment or not a passive investment, it's a diversified investment that is kind of molded by the best investing mind that has ever lived. Mm. So, I guess you can see it like that. Um, I'm sure a lot of people do invest in Berkshire Hathaway kind of thinking that like a set and forget kind of stock, even though it is an individual business. Um, I still would not treat it like an ETF. Yeah. I would definitely, if I was going to buy it, well, I hate, I guess we are Berkshire Hathaway shareholders <laughs> now. <laughs> uh, but if I was going to buy more than one singular share <laughs> to get into the AGM, um, I think I would still definitely do my j- due diligence on all the different core components of their business and, and, and treat it like an active investment that I've made in my portfolio. And I would make sure I read the quarterly reports and listen to the conference calls and that sort of thing. What do you think? Yeah, I pretty much completely agree with you. I think when I'm going for diversification, it's because I want to go because, you know, whenever I think about diversification, it's it's what don't I really, is there something I don't understand or don't know? And if that's the case, you want to have as much diversification as possible. So, for a portion in my portfolio, I want to go as broad as possible. Um, and while, yeah, Berkshire Hathaway does have a lot of businesses within it, it's still selective businesses. Um, so, you would, you know, I would not treat it like an ETF. I would treat it just like an individual business, except you have to make a judgment about, you know, some of the bigger components of, of Berkshire Hathaway. And I don't really understand, um, energy or insurance, um, or some of these other larger parts of Berkshire Hathaway. So that would kind of leave it out for me. Um, if I want diversification, I will go as broad as I can and, um, that usually treat it passively. Exactly. Yeah. That usually means either going broadly across the U S market or even broadly globally. Yeah. Nice. All right. Well, that will just about do us for today, yeah. guys. Uh, thank you, Hamish, for joining me as always. No worries. That was, uh, I thought we wouldn't have much to talk about today, but geez, we really, uh, we can fill out now, can't we? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if we're talking about streaming services, then yeah, I could, I could, I yeah, could, that's I could yarn on whatever for, <laughs> for hours now. <laughs> <It's> just, <laughs> just like, uh, so do you just talk about Netflix for a little bit? So in the Asia Pacific <laughs> region. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Indian revenues are up 13%. <laughs> exactly right. No, um, but yeah, thanks always for joining me, mate. And uh, hopefully you guys uh, enjoyed the podcast. As always, thank you very much for, for listening and giving us an hour of your time um, to, to listen to us yarn about all things investing in business. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I think that'll just about do us for today, mm. guys. Uh, oh, as always, if you have a question for... Uh, a future podcast that you would like to ask, just head over to the YouTube version of the podcast and drop us a comment. You can give us, you know, topic ideas if you want us to chat about something or you can just ask a Q&A question. Um, all comments are welcome. Head over there, except the nasty ones. You can keep those to yourself. <laughs> <laughs> nah, it's all good. Uh, head over there if you want to ask a question. But apart from that, guys, thank you very much for listening and we'll see you guys next week. See you guys. Bye.